Welcome to Gruesome, your horrific true crime podcast. I am Meg, and this birthday girl, Connie, is going to do the February 9th killer, because that's also her birthday, and that is today. Yeah, but today. For that, we are a Zencaster Power podcast. You thought you thought you missed it last week, but we're back with it. <laughs> and if you need a quick and easy way to start a podcast, and you can do it for free, you should go to C E N C A S T R dot com slash pricing. You can use the coupon code Gruesome and get thirty percent off your first three months, or you can just try it for free. Yeah. I recommend the paying one though. You get a lot of extras and the the video quality is like a lot better. But this episode is coming out. I would say today, like today is my birthday, but you know, when this episode gets released, it's going to be my birthday. And you guys know I'm a sucker for a theme. So naturally I had to give you guys a case where the date correlates with my birthday and honestly, when I first started thinking about this, literally like months ago, because it's my birthday, and it's my favorite Birthdays day. Birthdays are important. Yeah, like it's it's my favorite. I was thinking that I could find a case that happened just like around my birthday. I quickly came across the details of the dubbed February 9th killer, and I was like, "Well, that's perfect." Not that's the appropriate. Case. That's not, I mean, it's not a perfect case, but you know what I mean. Well, we did a Patreon hangout this weekend and like via our Discord, which by the way, if you guys came to that and hung out, that was the f- most fun I've had in weeks. It was a It blast. was really fun. It was, I was, I've been thinking about it too for the last couple of days since it happened and just like stuff we talked about or stuff people told me and I'm, it was yeah, delightful. it was so fun and I like we talk about it all the time. I have really bad social anxiety, which is a lot of times why like I don't we don't do it as often as we should because I get really stressed out. But I drank a whole bottle of champagne and I was loosey goosey on, on camera. <laughs> on camera. I was having some drinks with my pals. It's fine. <laughs> it was fun. It was fun. I had casually mentioned during this that I was gonna do a case that happened on my birthday. And our patrons started rapid firing different cases that happened on February 9th. And I was like, damn, this is kind of a busy day in the true crime world. So (laughs) without further ado, we're going to get to the February 9th killer. On February 9th, 2006, in Taylorsville, Utah, a neighbor witnessed 29-year-old Sonia Mija talking to a Hispanic male at her door. At 11.30 a.m. At some point during the conversation, things took a turn and the conversation turned violent. That same neighbor would later tell police that he saw the man put his hand around Sonia's neck, push her into the apartment. He says that the man struck her in the head with his other hand, and he believes that that man pushed her to the ground. Now... For whatever reason, before you ask, this man did not call 911. There was. Why would he? Six hours later, her husband comes home from work. It's around 6 p.m. He's coming home to see his wife. And I didn't say this earlier. And it's another reason why I got so mad at the neighbor. Sonia was six months pregnant at the time. Oh. Yeah. Sorry, guys. Trigger warning. Um, When he walked in, he realized something wasn't right. The house was like kind of a mess. He goes to the bedroom and there he finds his wife's body laying in their bed. He immediately called the police. Her car had been stolen as well as some cash. A ruby ring, a diamond ring. And a medallion of Our Lady of Guadalupe was, it had been fastened to like a gold chain that was also gone. An autopsy revealed that Sonia had been strangled. She had ligature marks around her neck and she had been sexually assaulted. Unfortunately, her unborn baby did not survive their mother. 
their mother's murder. Um, the autopsy report, because she was six months pregnant, so they did an autopsy on the baby as well, and um, they died as a result of maternal demise. Police were able to retrieve DNA from Sonia's body. Police canvassed the area the day of her murder, which is where they spoke to that neighbor. And much like the feelings I get when we talked about Kenny Genevieve's, I was sick to the stomach thinking it, the neighbor could have done something, you know, like they could have called the police, they could have, you know, intervened. But trying to have a more open mindset about things. So I was researching Taylorsville, Utah, and it actually has one of the highest crime rates in America. And that's in comparison of like communities of all sizes. The chances. Yeah. So they were just like maybe watching their own back. Yeah. That's yeah. The chances of someone becoming a victim of either a violent crime or a property crime is one in 26. Yeah, I don't yeah. like those odds. I would move. Yeah. It's there's like a one in forty chance that your car will be stolen. And it's in Utah. Utah, which was random to me. We're gonna get to we're gonna talk about Utah later on because I stumbled across some additional details about the area when I was researching this case. And I'm gonna talk about it at the end. So. I cannot say if the neighborhood was in a good area. It seems like Taylor Taylorsville as a whole is kind of, you know, it's kind of like a, it's a suburb of Salt Lake City. Um, so maybe the man was scared. He didn't want to be a target. He didn't, you know, like know what it was dealing with. Kind of like a not my bat situation. Like I don't want to, I don't want to deal with this. I and, don't have the capacity. Understandable. Yeah. And it doesn't like it doesn't make it any less of a horrific situation. But I did find myself having some empathy for the neighbor. Like, okay, I understand not wanting to get involved, but I still didn't get like why you wouldn't at least call the police. Yeah, you could like do it from inside the house, you know, uh, yeah. Overreact, don't underreact. Yes. Because At the very least, at six months pregnant, like maybe the baby would have had a chance to survive if the cops would have been able to respond in a timely manner. You Mm -hmm. know, because there was, yeah, we've seen it before, unfortunately. Like we've talked about, like, um, we've talked about pregnant women being murdered. And after a certain gestational period, like there was no trauma to her stomach. I mean, she was strangled. So science would be on the side of, that being able to say potentially, save the baby. yeah, yeah. Her family they were ruled out as suspects pretty early on, um, and the police were actually able to put together a full DNA profile based off of the DNA that was recovered. Um, the FBI directed the Taylorsville police to look for a man who may have had a history, like who would have had a history of abusing animals. Which is very broad. Yeah. Uh, um, I mean, I understand, but in the, I, I guess in a, like a state, you know, in a state that large, or in general in a state, you're like, we're just looking for one guy. He abuses mm-hmm. animals. Well, fortunately, the neighbor was able to give a pretty detailed description of the suspect. Um, they were looking for a Hispanic male between the ages of 20 and 29, medium build, approximately 5'6". His hair was combed straight back. It was described as being like cut very short, and he was between 135 and 150 pounds and would have had a history of abusing animals. Sonia's car, a gold four-door escort, was found four days later in the parking lot of the Fairfield Inn about 16 blocks away from her house. And like I said, based based on DNA evidence left at the scene, including there were fingerprints found on a Cheetos bag and a Coke bottle, police were able to put together a full profile of their suspect, but they had no leads. And her husband – this is what pissed me off. The Her husband had said that no one in their house drank Coke. That's not something they kept in. And they didn't keep Cheetos in their house. So this, these are 
food like he brought in. Like he would have had it with him. So he forces himself into her apartment, sexually assaults her, strangles her, ultimately murdering her and her unborn child, and then has like a snack. Just Ugh. leaves. It's sick. And leaves the trash in her car. Rude. No, that was in her apartment. <gasps> that was in her apartment? Yeah. That's even worse. I thought you yeah. said they found it in her car. No, no, it Ew. was in her apartment. Because, like, her husband was like, we don't keep this stuff here. We don't. This is. Ew. So her case, unfortunately, went cold. Was she the victim of a random attack? Like, what was going on in a, you know, like, in a town or, that has, like, such a high crime rate? Like, what? It's hard to say. Police were stumped. Police would get answers. Not the break in the case they would have hoped for. But two years later, to the day later. Two years to the day later. On February 10th, 2008, 57-year-old Damiana Castillo didn't show up for church. This was not like her. She didn't miss appointments. She wasn't late for church. Like She was a very timely person. She was there every Sunday. She had moved to West Valley City, Utah from Mexico City. When her son went to check on her to make sure like everything was okay, you know, she's older. He thought like maybe she had gotten sick. Maybe she fell. Like He thought like he was going to find his mom like where she may have just needed help. To his horror, he found his mother's body directly inside the door of her apartment She had also been strangled with evidence of ligature marks around her neck, and she was also sexually assaulted. A table had been turned over. There were signs of a struggle. Damiana had also been robbed. Her purse and wallet had been dumped on the couch, and her jewelry box had been ransacked. Her obituary said that she was a grandmother and a friend, And she was one to have had a kind word and blessing for whoever's path she crossed. And I was like, gooded. Her apartment was only one mile away from Sonia Mija's apartment. One mile. like a pretty big link. Mm Mm-hmm. So police were like, okay, so we have these two women murdered exactly two years to the day apart. Both women were Hispanic, both were strangled, both were sexually assaulted, both were robbed. Neither women had signs of a forced entry. They were like, what what is this? Because they were not, they were noting the similar similarities in the case, but they were not saying at this point that it could be a serial killer. They were Honestly, they like they were just like maybe this is pretty close. Yes, but they were like nope, like they were staying far away from that term. Police were able to also recover DNA evidence from Damiana scene. Um, she had there was DNA recovered from the ligature marks around her neck, and they were able to compare it with the sample recovered from Sonia's body, and it was a match. They were able to recover fingerprints from her wallet and they compared them to fingerprints that were found at Sonia's and they, those were also a match. So they're like, okay, we have one suspect here, but is this a serial killer? Is this like, is February 9th of any importance? Is this like, you know, coincidence? Her her ligature marks matched. In that the same thing was used? No, the they had DNA, like the DNA, because they extracted DNA from the ligature ligature, um, that he used to strangle her. Oh, okay, okay. And that DNA profile matched the profile that they were able to extract from Sonia's body. Okay, I think my brain was processing another thing when you were explaining that thing. So I was like, yeah, gotcha. Police put together a force or a task force of 20 people to try and find out who was responsible for the murders, as well as try and see if there were any other cases in the area that could be connected. Because like I said, they had, we, I love DNA. That is like, you guys know this. I love the DNA side of true crime. And it is not often where you have great fingerprints 
a full DNA profile. Like right off you, the bat, right off the bat. Like that's not sat in a lab for 40 or 50 years. Like this is a fresh, like they have what they need. So they were like, we're going to be able to compare this to other crimes that have happened. Like, do we have a serial killer? Like, is this guy? Did this happen two years ago before that yeah. on February 9th? But there was nothing. Police would patrol extra during the time frames, like around February 9th, when the murders took place, because neighbors would get sketched out, like the neighborhoods were on high alert because they... Yeah, they should get sketched out. Yeah. Um, and actually, and something I haven't seen before, they actually put together an arrest warrant for a John Doe because they had this full DNA profile and it was so strong. And the arrest warrant was for the murder charges of Sonia, Damiana, and Sonia's unborn child. Aggravated sexual assault for Sonia and Damiana. Because they were convinced they were going to find this person at some point. They were like, we know we're going to be able to find them and we're going to have an arrest warrant to get them. Ready to go. It. Which I haven't seen that before. I'm sure it has happened, obviously, because they wouldn't have been able to just like, you know, hey, we're going to do I this. I don't think I can recall a time where we've talked about having like a John Doe usually, suspect. Yeah. And I feel like usually it's the opposite. It's like they don't have the DNA like that we saw in this case. Yeah. A break in the case wouldn't come until 2016. Eight years after Damiana was murdered, 10 years after Sonia was murdered, fingerprint analysts broke the case wide open. Another reason I love DNA. And the technicians that work in labs are my heroes. If you are a technician that analyzes fingerprints or DNA or any of that, like, please it's such like a, It's a niche job, right? Yes. Like, you're one of only, like, so many people that can do that in the whole wide world. So cool. And if you do this, please reach out so I can fangirl. <laughs> please. Because I... I go like above and beyond with it. Like I find I'll go into like uh, articles and I start reading about like all the advances and the texts that do it. And it's, it's such a, I should have done it. Like that's one of those, like that's one of those careers. I'm like, damn it. It's not too late. You still could. I could. Have you ever seen the thing where like koala's fingerprints are so close to human fingerprints that they Mm -hmm. have contaminated crime scenes before? I've like, I don't know what kind of crime scenes that koalas are at, but... In Australia? Yeah, that's true. I mean, but they're not just chilling in murder scenes or robberies. If out- but if it's outside, maybe. Yeah, maybe. That's true. Well, now I have to find this out. Now I have to see... If you were a koala that wanted to make a... Ro- like, wanted to pull a robbery off, <laughs> you could do it. You could make that... You could frame someone for it. Easy. What if you wanted to use a koala during the robbery? Yeah, like you keep one and like a like a baby Bjorn on you. <laughs> You're like, just putting its little paws on things. Man, that's scary to think about. And now if someone does it, they're going to come after us. So Scary and adorable. It is adorable. Like if I got <laughs> robbed by a koala, I would be like, Okay. Just take it. It's fine. I'll cancel my cards. <laughs> Here you go. Would you like some eucalyptus? <laughs> Eat the sleep. Let me watch you do it. And then you can have everything I have, including my children if you need it. Anyways, I digress. <laughs> the database revealed that the fingerprints belong to Juan Antonio Ariola Morillo, a 41-year-old man who had been arrested and convicted of fraud in 2008, the same year Damiana was murdered. The fingerprint on the Cheetos bag was his right index finger. The print from the Coke bottle was his right thumb. And the print on Damiana's wallet was his right middle finger. 
So you're like, hey, we have all of this. Let's go. Let's get this man. Let's we get our guy. We have an arrest warrant. We have an arrest warrant. The problem was he had been deported to Mexico after he was convicted. Literally. A fraud? Mm-hmm. Literally okay. eight months after Damiana's murder, he was deported for fraud. So Damn. Now, so now it's a whole other delicate situation. Police had the difficult task of an extradition, which can be very difficult. Investigators were able to let the public know that they 100% knew who killed both women and that more details would come in the future, but that was it. So in 2017, an official arrest warrant was issued, but like I said, the details of the arrest warrant and the names were all sealed due to the delicate nature of the extradition. So think about this. In 2016, like these investigators knew exactly who killed these women. Exactly who. They could have, they were able to tell their, the victims' families. They were just like, hey, we know who did this, but. But we can't. They're out do of our jurisdiction about it right yet. now. And like that's what they kept saying, like, they're out of our, they didn't want him to know that they were looking for him because it's, it's hard benign. enough. Yeah, it's hard enough. And like they knew where he was in Mexico. So they didn't want him to run. They they had no doubt in their minds, like the prints were perfect matches. And do you want to guess when he was extradited back to the United States? February 9th. I wish. <laughs> it wasn't. It wasn't. Man, I really hope this is going to be a full circle situation. But exactly one month ago, Around January 10th, 2022, the records were finally unsealed because Juan Antonio Ariola Murillo was booked into Salt Lake City, Salt Lake County Jail, facing the charges of three counts of aggregated murder, two counts of aggregated burglary, and aggravated robbery. All of the charges are first degree felonies, but Unfortunately, in this situation, um, the death penalty is not on the table. Like, it's not even an option for the um, for them to pursue because part of the extradition laws state that they cannot extradite and pursue the death penalty. So it's like you can't extradite them just to kill them. Yeah, that's, I understand that. Yeah. So does he have to serve a sentence in Mexico? Do they, does he go no. back to serve or does he nope, stay be here, here to serve? That was part okay. of it. That's why they couldn't pursue the death penalty because he's going to serve out his sentence here in the United States. But they weren't going to let him have like they the Mexican government wasn't going to let like us have him if we were going to pursue the death penalty. Do you know how that works? I personally don't. How like if they sent the chart, could they charge him in Mexico or does it have to happen in Mexico? Because I keep thinking of like their Matthew Taylor Coleman case where he mm-hmm. went to Mexico and then came back yeah. and was able to be charged. Was he charged in the U.S. or was he charged yeah. in Mexico? Yeah, he was. Tra- you're charged. Yeah. He was charged in the U.S. And like same yeah. situation here. Like he doesn't have he didn't commit the murders in the United States, which is what makes it so difficult a lot of the times. Because if you like hightail it to a different company or company, if you hightail company. it to a different country. Um, some, like there are countries where we can't extradite from. So it makes it like extremely difficult. And I'm not too, and I'm not sure if this like, uh, no death penalty rule is like universal. If that's like just part of the laws of it, or if it was specific to this case, I'll be honest, I'm not too familiar with like extradition laws. Um, I don't read a lot of cases where it's, it's like pertinent information what are you know i guess maybe you don't do you know what the countries are that you can like go to and you can't be extradited back to i actually have it saved on my phone well fill me in not that like i have it saved um in case i need it (laughs) in case i need to commit a crime and (laughs) run to another country um 
Kurdish. There's like a whole list of them. Um, Afghanistan, Algeria, Angola. There's there's a ton of them. Um, Yemen. It's like a treaty, right? Like that. Yeah. The U.S. Like, has to make like a deal way before, like beforehand, that says, yeah. "Hey, if there's someone." Yeah, like uh, Lebanon, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Russia, Rwanda, Samoa, Mongolia. I mean, our peop- listeners can't like see it, but there's like a whole list. There's, I mean, China, Congo, um, Ethiopia. I pulled one up. You can go to the Maldives. 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 Go to Morocco. Maldives. Whatever you want. <laughs> yeah. We know we're super good at pronouncing yeah. Please. Oh my God. We're going to get so many messages. Like that is not how you say this. I'm like, I know. speaking of which I have another, um, Pacific Northwest case coming up. So I'm going to put, I'm going to put some, uh, pronunciations out there. So everyone can tell me <laughs> what to say before I say it. Um, apparently the best non-extradition countries for your escape plan are Russia, China, Mongolia, the Gulf States, which that doesn't make sense. The Gulf States, like Alabama? That's what I think of when I think of the Gulf States. (laughs) I could be wrong. Um, Eastern Europe, like Ukraine and Moldova, uh, Vietnam, Cambodia, Cambodia, uh, the Maldives, Indonesia, Ethiopia, Botswana, and it's the Persian Gulf. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Like, yeah. it's like the Gulf states, like Alabama. <laughs> they don't, there's still, because it's like a, I'm just going to like say. like a civil war thing that never got hammered out. There just isn't an extradition treaty. <laughs> that would be that crazy. Would, but I would think, and this is nothing, the South hands out some pretty gnarly punishments especially in like capital murder, rape, child crime cases. So I would picture, like I picture, and I know this is wrong and someone's going to get mad that I say this. I picture like someone being in Ohio committing a murder, maybe, you know, like sexual assault murder, and they go to like Alabama. And Alabama's like, we'll take it from here. (laughs) Tip their hat. And then it's like, oh shit, I came to the wrong state. Because they're like, we don't mess around down here. (laughs) <laughs> we'll take it from here. What if there was just one state that we sent all of the criminals to? What state do you think? I can't even talk about what state it, I would think it was. We're, we're going gonna... to make somebody upset because you're like, you never put them in my state. I feel like the state with like the least amount of stuff. West Virginia. <sighs> that They have mountains and stuff. Yeah, but that's part of your punishment. You have to live in the mountains with nothing. Someone in those mountains is going to eat them. I guess that is pretty fair punishment. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that's true, but have you guys heard those like that yeah. there are pe- there are cannibals that live in the like Yes, things? yes they're yeah. in, like you've seen it and I still have a little bit to talk about this case, but I have to say this really quick because I don't get scared driving at night very often. We have talked about my one time by the cemetery where I'm pretty sure I saw a ghost and I'm still like, I can't talk about it too much because I'm going to have nightmares about it tonight. But driving in the mountains in West Virginia with no cell phone service, the only gas stations you pass look like they're from the Hills Have Eyes. And it is... When I would drive back and forth, like from when I lived down south, West Virginia was the scariest place that I have ever driven through. Now, I will say my in-laws lived in Kentucky and like they would like they lived right on the border. So my father-in-law actually worked in like West Virginia, but it's they're the nicest people. Like they are so sweet and so nice, but the landscape is terrifying. There's just secret feral humans in the Smoky Mountains. That's just what I'm saying. Yeah, and there are <laughs> children. Like, that's your punishment. Like, I'm going to set you loose in the mountains with my children. <laughs> the, Maybe the like, odds our kids these. are the feral ones, yeah. Yeah. They do bite. That <laughs> checks out. They do. And we carry diseases, apparently, because my kids are always sick these days. We're going to bite you and give you the flu. 
So I was gonna say, you still have more on this case though. I Keep know. going. I'm sorry. Yeah, that was sorry. really a derail. Sorry guys. You can leave a review about how much you hated that. Um, <laughs> Uh, so police had put together a paper, paper trail of him, um, over the last few years, like why they were waiting for like him to be extradited. Um, and they, the address that he gave when he was deported was the apartment complex where Sonia lived when she was murdered. Was it the neighbor? No, no, it wasn't the neighbor. I really thought that that was going to come back, like that it had been the neighbor the whole time. No. That is like, that's the kind of leads I usually le- take you around, but no, not yeah, this time. Yeah, that's true, you do. That is your normal joyride. So he lived, that's why they were so close, is because he lived at that apartment complex. Yes. Um, uh, so like as of literally last month, he is awaiting trial. And obviously we're going to update this as we can. I hope they sentence him on February 9th because that would be sweet, sweet justice. I know they could have waited like one extra month just mm-hmm. to like for that poetic – that mm-hmm. poetic justice. <laughs> and a spokeswoman for the West Valley Police Department said that the arrest is a direct result of, quote, never give up attitude of investigators, which I agree with. Um, and what's crazy, and this is what I love about true crime, is I decided, like I said, I talked, I started thinking about this case like a few months ago. Um, and when I first started researching it, I had read the article that showed like they knew who did it, but they were like the DNA was like, like the name was sealed. And I found that like the chatter of it, I guess, like, you know, you know, you research and you fall, you fall down those holes of like Reddit theories and you're like, well, this may who not make it? sense, but I have to like see what other people are thinking about this. Um, and so like, I saw a lot of like, they know who did it, but they're just not saying type conversations like on Reddit. Um, so once I actually started, like I sat down to write the episode, they had released who he was. And I was like, holy shit, this went from like a, you're not going to know who did it. Like, we know, but we can't tell you to like, I can tell you guys exactly what happened, but good timing. It was very good. I would really like to know the significance of February 9th. So this is what's crazy. Uh, February, they, police officer, like officers do not believe that February 9th had any type of significance. They think it was a coincidence. Um, Cause there was nothing else. Like there's nothing else. There's nothing in his past. Like they have found, I mean, granted it could come out that there was a significance, but at this present time, they don't think it is, but his negligence for dates is what got him caught. Because had he done these, like, has had he committed these two murders separately, like, two years apart in different days, we would not be talking about this right now. Like, we would not be talking about them finding him, them extraditing him. So even mm-hmm. though the, the profile would, was the exact same, though, you really don't think so? No, because, like, what kept this case in the public eye and, like, what kept it like people nagging investigators about it. Cause like they had the profile, you know, like I think he actually, I think he still would have got caught. I don't think it would have been like the phenomena that it was like the February 9th killer. Like, and I don't think it would have been cause the public had a lot to do with the, I don't want to say nagging, but nagging investigators about this <laughs> because well, they yeah, were, you, you're Can worried. You say, like, hey, we still want to know what happened. We still like, are. Are like, we safe? Like, are, do we need to stay home? Like, are our moms and our grandmothers safe on February 9th? Like, what's happening? It's a, it's accountability. It's not yeah. nagging. But like I said, I wanted to talk about this Utah situation because we talk a lot about Canada and like the thousands of indigenous people who have been murdered or who are missing and it's kind of gone unaccounted for. But I was on, um, there's the Utah cold case files website and I was looking for information about Sonia and Damiana and ran across like just in my quick, like just searching their names there's like 40 or 50 Latinos on there that have either cold cases or they're missing in Utah. And it's, it was alarming because there were more pages I could have went through. Like, what the hell is going on in Utah? 
uh, they're like, not getting proper representation. They're not yeah, getting like, that what? same, like, they're not all getting that same thing that this one case got because it happened a year apart and it was, it, no one's sensationalizing it, you know? It's yeah, the same and, thing that always happens to marginalized groups. And I, it's something that I am going to dive into. Like, I'm really going to dive into it because as we talked about it a little bit on the like Patreon hangout. Like my mom's side of the family is Hispanic. So seeing like pictures of women on there, men on there who look like my family. And I was like, oh my God, like this is heartbreaking to see. Like it was heartbreaking. And it's, they're all cold cases and missing people and I know that this is a problem everywhere, but I have not – it's like you know that something's going on, but until you see it, it doesn't, like, gut you like that. And seeing that website and, like, seeing, like, just it, – it was sad. Like, it, I was, like, kind of choked up by it. I had to step away for a minute from this case just because it was so – like, it's – I hate a cold case anyways, but – they're so like it's there's just so much the the amount of them yeah too. Ugh. yeah yeah that so, it's awful yeah so I need to know if you are in Utah sorry what? I'm not laughing I'm just saying <laughs> you said I need yeah. to know if you yeah. are in Utah if you are in Utah and like you're around the Salt Lake City area like I need to know what is going on. Or you can say, Connie, you are completely off base. Like, it is not the shithole that you're saying this Taylorsville area is. Like, I need to know. Like, I need to know, one, if I'm wrong, and two, if I'm right. Preferably number two. Let me know that I'm you right. You know, I really didn't, ex- I didn't expect it. Like, I didn't expect with the stats you gave on that city. That's pretty, uh, it's pretty gnarly. Yeah. Like, maybe somewhere that was more, uh, like, a suburb of Chicago or a suburb of, like, Washington, D.C., L.A., yeah, something like that. Yeah. Uh, Because I would expect, like, not that it makes it any easier to see, but I would expect to see um, those kind of crimes against, like, Latinos in, like, a heavily, like, Latino-centric area, like L.A., you know, San Diego. Like, if I don't think I would have been as affected because we – I, I'll be the first to admit, I don't know a lot about Utah. Like, I like obviously, like, I know it's a state, but it's not, like, I'm not familiar with it. Like, I'm not, I I don't even think I've ever been there. So it was but just. it feels like, based on what you saw, it looked like they were ignoring these cases. It looked like that. Yeah, like, it looks like, or is there, like, is it, like, heavily, like, is there, a, like, is the Latino community, like, is it heavily populated? Like, is this, you know, like on, not, I don't want to say on par, but like, do the stats Comparable. match the, like, does, does the stats map match the population? Like, am I being too sensitive about this? Because I am being extremely sensitive about this. Because it okay. sucks. You're allowed to be. Yes. You're allowed to be sensitive about it. It's your own feelings. My feelings. You can feel things. It's just, it's so hard to see cold cases in general. Yeah, it is. You're right. Like it's, I think about like our families, like friends and like just if you, if I had to go just not knowing what happened, like that to me would be unimaginable. A fate worse than death. Yeah, because then you're constantly, there's never any closure. You're constantly questioning what what happened, what could have been done differently, what could could I have done something differently, you know? And Mm -hmm. no, like, no, it's it's just the way it ended up. (sighs) I'm just going to picture koalas and baby Bjorns now. Yeah, it's a little bit easier (laughs) to picture than... (laughs) than jillions of cold cases so sad it's i after i got finished after i was finished with that episode i feel a lot more bummed out than i did when i first started (laughs) (laughs) that's normal happy birthday doing an ad make you feel better yeah (laughs) doing an ad get your mind off of it it would um 
We had this is I think this is the only testimony that you need for Zencaster on our Patreon episode this weekend. We had one of the patrons specifically say, I can tell exactly when you guys started using Zencaster. Period. That's all you need to like that's it. Like <laughs> it's true, yes. They're like you can we leveled out, our sound sounded more professional. Yep. It made our lives easier. It's made my life so much easier on the post-production side of it. It is no experience necessary. You should start a podcast. You should use Zencaster. They have some really cool features that when they officially get re- released, we can like dive into. Our patrons are going to get some use out of some of these new cool features that we're going to be able to do. Um, the biggest one that we're really excited for is mobile recording. We know everybody loves St. Karen. We love St. Karen. What's stopping St. Karen from being able to record with us periodically is the fact that she lives in Louisiana and she doesn't have an active Wi-Fi internet because she lives in the boonies. The boonies. So, but Zencaster is going to change that. They're saving the day. They're going to have (laughs) Zencaster bringing us St. Karen. We are going to do. We're thinking about doing a live episode. We're going to LA next month um, for a podcast convention, and we're going to test out this in Caster Mobile. So if you want to start a podcast, if you don't have a computer, that's the cool thing. If you don't have a computer and you want to start a podcast, do it from your phone. You can do it from your phone. So go to Zencaster.com slash pricing, um, promo code gruesome with a capital G for 30% off your first three months. It's awesome. Send us your podcast when you guys start. And so we yeah, can listen. We want to listen. And I am, we're going to cut it short because it's my birthday. And by that, I mean tomorrow's my birthday. So I have to like shower and like do my hair tomorrow for work. And like, so when people are like, happy birthday, I can be like, oh my God, thanks. It's my birthday. It's actually your birthday in not that long. It's coming up Please. 30 minutes. 30 minutes. 35 minutes. I'm going to be 33. <gasps> 33 and 22. I had a moment with it where uh, I've been having a midlife crisis lately with like careers and just being a millennial adult, like not knowing what the hell I want to do with my life, like being like, I don't, I don't know what I, I want to be when I grow everything. up. Yeah. And it's really hard when you have something that you love to do as much as I love to do this podcast with you and like everything that involves it. I'm sure you feel the same about school. Absolutely. It has been such it's, a pain to pay attention because all I think about all the time is gruesome. Mm-hmm. I'm just like, mm-hmm. who needs to talk about period on Titus? When I can think about writing this new episode. <laughs> yeah, and like we have big goals for gruesome. Like, I don't know, a network where we can bring on some of your other podcasts that you guys are creating. You know, that's a secret that I don't know yeah, if I was supposed secrets. to. secrets. What are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe one day. Not while I work this damn job, though, guys. So that's what I'm having my midlife crisis about. But my husband so lovingly told me, 33 is your year, babe. And I'm like, I feel that. Big things coming. For both of our year 33. 33 is going to be big for me too when I get there in just a couple of years after you. <laughs> That's kidding. not true. It's May. It's my birthday's in not May. I will also I, be 33. <laughs> not only am I a cougar with my husband, but I am also a cougar with my friends. I like to feel I, older and superior. <laughs> I'm sorry. I could not resist that moment in time. <laughs> <laughs> just doing that to you. You're struggling with 33. Well, I don't know. I'm not going to be there I'm yet. I'm very excited about 33. For my whole life, I always wanted to be 30. Like when I was a kid, I was like, I can't wait to be 30. And now that I'm in my 30s, I'm like, hell yeah. It's not that cool now that no. I'm here. <laughs> I, I think that I struggle with imposter syndrome. It's part of my ADHD. <laughs> but like I look around at other people who are like my age, a little bit older, a little bit younger. And I'm like, how do you guys have your shit together? Like, I need to know, like, how are you guys getting up on time every day? How do you make sure your kids are getting all the things that they need? Not like I'm neglecting my kids. I just had this conversation today. How do people like 
dress their kids cute and themselves cute at the same yeah. time. It's yeah. like How I have that? a I I I get so lost at night, like in my brain, that I like look at the clock and I'm like, shit, it's two o'clock. And then I get my four or five hours of sleep. But I still am like barely making it on time to work. And I mean that like I don't make it on time to work very often. I mean that by I don't. I'm not on time to work. It's a personality (laughs) flaw at this point. Like I physically cannot be on time. Like I can't. Like That's who you are as a person now. You have we have like the birthday party this weekend, and I'm like I gotta leave my house four hours early to you make. You did sh- say you were gonna be early. Yeah, and that's why. Like I'm leaving early. Like I, it's like a you're leaving I, early so you get there on time. Mm-hmm. Because <laughs> I get uh, the time paralysis where it's like I can't do anything. I have to leave at this time, and I, I feel do like anything before this thing happens in six hours. Well, I feel like when you have like pretty gnarly ADHD, you are one of the two. You either like obsessively am early everywhere or you cannot be on time. And I am the latter, unfortunately. Oh, I'm the first. I cannot be late. I am just like, I get like bone crushing anxiety from being late. Like... I think that everyone is mad at me. I've put everyone out by being late. I am just like ruining the event, the lives of everyone around me because I am 15 minutes late. I overthink going at all. <laughs> like, like, I have think you'll miss me. <laughs> I physically, I have to wake up every morning and physically talk myself into going to work. Like I just have, and I do it in steps and like, Maybe you can relate. I'm like, okay, you just have to put your feet on the floor. Like, you just have to put your feet on the floor. And then I'm like, you just have to get up. You just have to get up. You just have to shower. And then I don't feel bad. Like, I'll do a quick shower if it's like, it's not your thing today. Like, it's okay. You're not, that's not where you are today. I'm like, okay, it's fine. You just don't have to stink today. It's fine. You just. You can even stink a little bit as long as no one can get just just stay away from people today. <laughs> it's six feet, remember, guys? But that's uh, how I have to do it. And like I hate it because I I feel like it makes me a worse parent because we're those people who are always like, come on, come on, you gotta go, you gotta go. We're late, we're late. And by we're late, I mean I have poor time management and we're I'm late. And now you guys are also late. Like unless my husband is taking charge, we are never on time. Well, you will be tomorrow because you make the time tomorrow. It's your birthday. <laughs> yes. I will be on time tomorrow because there's nothing I love more than being told happy birthday. It's my <laughs> favorite day of the year. I love it. I I th- I give so much to my kids and my husband <laughs> like every other day and I'm just like, "Hey guys, all fuck off. It's my day." Hi, hey everybody could everybody just please fuck off because this it's is mine my, it's my birthday <laughs> you want to what i don't care it's my birthday i'm gonna <laughs> okay, go to well, starbucks go, go, have a, yeah. go have a happy birthday get your starbucks everybody get a starbucks and toast it to connie for her birthday yeah see you guys next week